This is One on One. We are pleased to be joined by Michael Gross. He is a journalist and the author of a compelling new book called Focus, the secret, sexy, sometimes sordid world of fashion photographers. Good to see you, Michael. Nice to be here, Steve. What makes the world of fashion photographers so incredibly interesting? Well, they're the people who kind of encapsulate dreams. They take, um, they take a beautiful girl in a frock and they have to do something more with it. And they, uh, what fashion photography has done in the last 50 years is really capture the moment in a way that no other art form does because it's so instantaneous, it's constantly changing. If it's not changing, it's not doing its job. Who are these people? Well, in the book, what I do is I concentrate on about 15 of them. Mm. And they're the ones who invented the genre, who changed the conversation, or who lived the life of fashion photographer to the fullest, which of course means that they got around a lot. Now, some of these players, uh, some of these fashion photographers, by the way, were they players? Oh, some of them are serious players. Describe that. Well, uh, look at Gilles Ben Simone, who was the uh, photographer who ended up running Elle magazine. In was the he la- married to Kelly Ben he, Simone? He was married to Kelly Ben Simone, but much more important before that to Elle McPherson. Yes, much more important. A.K.A. The The Body. body. (laughs) Yes. Not that I pay attention to these Um, things. You know, Gilles is a guy who early in his career only dated editors who could help him rise as a fashion photographer. And then at a certain point, he suddenly discovered that all of those girls that he was seeing through his lens were available to him. And he indulged greatly. Um, And so he had a series of affairs with ever hotter models leading to the real housewife mm. um, and and you know this is a guy who lived the life there's stuff about him that I can't say on television but um, I'm trying to think if there's a way to say it he's a very big man we are public broadcasting we're a family series in we the fashion appreciate... business <laughs> yes we appreciate your candor um, so let me let me ask you this Michael this industry right how much of it is art How much of it is politics and how much business? Loaded question, I know. Well, I think it's a combination of the three. You know, in the best cases, they make it art. Basically, it's about moving merchandise. That's what it's about. Moving merchandise. Moving merchandise. It's about selling frocks. And these days, it's more about selling scarves, perfumes, and the little tchotchkes that have some brand's name on them rather than frocks, because frocks cost too much money. Frocks are just the, um, the loss leaders, basically, in the fashion business these days. Where the art comes in is when you get somebody like a Richard Avedon who's really good at it. Explain to people who that is. Well, Richard Avedon started taking pictures in 1946. Mm. He became the chief photographer of Harper's Bazaar through the 50s. Um, I think the, the, the clearest indication of his importance is that a Richard Avedon photograph holds the record for the highest price ever paid for a fashion right photo. That's Dick. Um, the highest price ever paid for a fashion photo, which is in excess of $1 million <sighs> for his photograph, Dovima and the Elephants, which is that wonderful model standing with the elephants also posing like a wonderful model. Um, over a million dollars at auction. Now, somewhere he crossed the line from commerce into art. Um, and he really represents, he and Irving Penn probably represent the pinnacle of fashion photography. For you, the fascination with celebrity, people in this world, um, your dad was? My father was Milton Gross. He was a syndicated sports columnist yeah. for the New York Post in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so as a kid, in the notes I was getting ready for the show, you interacted with, you knew of Mickey Mantle and Sandy Koufax. Well, yeah, I mean, I kind of grew up in Yankee Stadium and the polo grounds and Madison, the various Madison Square yes. Gardens and hanging around while my father did his job. And I can't um, believe that picture. Ah, uh, yeah. I cannot make, believe that He picture. wanted me to go into the batting cage that day. And then he saw that Mel Stottlemyre was pitching. And Stottlemyre, Stottlemyre, Stottlemyre was very young then. And he said, no, Stottlemyre is a little too wild. I don't think it's safe. So my, I was foiled from getting into the batting cage. I will tell you, and there's Sandy Koufax. Boy, I'll tell you. Um, Let me ask you something. For you, these celebrities, are they more interesting than the rest of us, or are they just in different positions? 
I was more interested in what, for lack of a better term, is called the zeitgeist. I was more interested in where the cultural fascination was. So when I was a kid, you know, you're 11 years old, what do you care about? You care about your team. Yes. When I got to be 13 years old, I didn't care about my father's people anymore. I cared about rock stars. Yes. You know, that's who was cracking the whip on the culture at that point. When I got out of college, I went to work as a rock magazine editor. Um, what I discovered was that rock stars all dated models. Models were you know, kind of interesting as you're getting a little older. Yes. And um, at a certain point, I segued into covering the fashion business. And it was really just a case of chasing girls. But um, you know, what happened was I became really interested in the fashion business. Through the fashion business, because I was sitting in the front row at fashion shows, covering fashion for the New York Times, I was seated next to basically the aristocracy of the world, or at least their wives and whichever husbands came along to the shows. <laughs> and I became fascinated with rich people. So the two areas that I've concentrated on as an adult has been fashion mm -hmm. and what I refer to as the American aristocracy, which is rich people. So what's interesting about this is in your book, Focus, uh, you, well, there are a lot of things you can't talk about. You do talk about an awful lot of people in ways that I'm sure would be interesting, but also potentially embarrassing for some of them. Fair to say? Well, I, you know, are you embarrassed by what you've done? Well, here's my question. Have you gotten any blowback from this? Well, not yet. Nobody's read it. You're one of the first. Well, will you? I imagine that there might be some because people who are in positions of celebrity and power become accustomed to being told yes and occasionally someone comes along and says no. I'll give you an example. Sure. The, Richard Avedon has passed away. Dick actually inspired my writing this book because he inspired my writing the predecessor book which I wrote 20 years ago called Model. Yes. And um, so now it's 20 years later. Avedon has died. And I know that the Richard Avedon Foundation will not allow me to run any Richard Avedon photographs unless I submit their, my book for their approval. And I don't write for their approval. I write for readers. I don't write for subjects. There are two kinds of people. It's a conflict. Who, well, there are two kinds of people who do this job. There are the ones who want to be invited to lunch, and there are the ones who want to entertain the people who buy their books. You're the second type. I want to be in, I want to inform and entertain the people who buy my books, and my responsibility is to them not to my subjects, uh, sure, there are places where one doesn't go. One doesn't cross certain lines. I find children a little bit out of bounds. Now, again, in the case of the Richard Avedon Foundation, who runs the Richard Avedon Foundation? His son. Right. So you have to mention John Avedon. But they're John adults, Avedon, and they're but, not children, children. And they're adults, and they're not children. And you know, you don't go into the bathroom, but occasionally when someone puts their sexuality on the line, the bedroom mm -hmm. becomes fair game as well. Now that might be a place for potential embarrassment, but if you're someone like Calvin Klein, who is advertising with millions and millions of dollars and you're selling ideas about hedonism and about gender, and you're using that to sell jeans and underwear, then I think your own personal behavior becomes absolutely fair game. Before I let you out here, photography, fashion photography, has changed dramatically. You say today it's more by committee. Photography by committee, what do you mean? Well, you know, the digital revolution destroyed a lot of art forms and businesses. Uh, you know, it, it, it's harmed books, it's harmed music. It's also harmed fashion photography because A, fashion photography is now a democratic medium. Anyone can do it. B, digital has killed fashion magazines and fashion magazines were the Medici's of fashion photography. Also, the, because of digital and because of the way the world has changed, big brands now dominate everything. So when you go to a photo set, instead of seeing one model, one photographer, and maybe one editor, there's a team of 40 people who are deciding, and they're looking at instantaneous images on a screen, move that, change this. And it's become illustration, not photography, and it's become creativity by committee. And creativity by committee is a very different form than a single person making a piece of art that is designed to delight and astonish or shock or make you go, mmm, which is what the best yeah. fashion photography can do. The book is called Focus, the uh, secret, sexy, sometimes sordid world of fashion photographers. The author is Michael Gross. Go out and get it. Good stuff. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, Michael. Very compelling. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation.
celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by TD Bank, Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, Suez, Qualcare Inc., Choose New Jersey, NJ Best, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, the statewide voice of business in New Jersey, and by bestofnj.com, covering all New Jersey has to offer. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.